G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. My name is Caden McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host Connor Rogers. Rogie, how are you mate? Well, the world has absolutely turned to shit, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We've got uh, another couple of weeks in lockdown, the curfew's back, the Taliban have taken over <laughs> Afghan. It just seems like there's no way out of this hellhole, but no. on the on the flip side of that tragic uh, world coin, we've got finals footy on the horizon. The, the buy has been scrapped. It's only two weeks away. The D's are on top of the ladder, so we can't complain too much, can we? Well, yes. Look, we'll, we'll try and find the bright <laughs> Actually, side. you know what? We probably can complain a bit. <laughs> we'll try and do what the killers do and uh, find the Mr. Bright side out of the situation, even though it is a pretty... As Dan Andrews said, pretty shitty situation we're in at the moment. Uh, but we still got footy rolling along, and that's a pretty key part of my week. And it has been keeping me awfully enthused. And we'll kick things off here at the Back Pocket Plug Up podcast with the headline. Roggy, take us away, well, mate. Yeah, well, uh, I won't lie to you, McDonald. I actually forgot to whip one up. So this was off the top of the top of the chrome dome. We like a freestyle. I'm gonna yeah, I'm going to fire away with uh, Bulldogs lost their bite. <laughs> That's a ripper. I gave you the headline with about 30 seconds notice, and that's one of your best, I reckon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, What the bloody hell has happened there? They're meant to have the greatest midfield of a generation just about, and they can't win a bloody centre clearance. Well, that is worrying, and it's worrying this time of year. Um, You know, uh, a personal anecdote, uh, talking about the Ds when they dropped a little bit of form, it was sort of... Rounds 15 to 18, 19, but it gives you enough time to get a little momentum going into the finals. But I was worried when the Ds sort of fell off their form and got into a little bit of a slump. And I think the Lions timed it around a similar time. The Lions dropped a couple games, but still had four or five games to go before the end of the season to turn it around. The Bulldogs have timed it quite poorly where they've timed it right at the end of the season. So they've got a tough, tough match against the Power. I still feel like if they beat the Power... They're sort of back in business, but they couldn't have timed it any poorly. And to go down against the Hawks in Launceston definitely wasn't on the uh, the, the plans for the weekends for the boys. No, absolutely not. And uh, you could see Bevo after the game looking as if he didn't have any answers. <laughs> yeah. like, he looked like as he, he didn't even know what question to ask. He, he was just in absolute licorice all sorts. And... Um, you know, while it's a major concern for the Bulldogs, it is not a major concern for my quite extravagant uh, little gamble I had on the Demons to win the Premiership because <laughs> the Bulldogs are sliding at a rapid rate and it's hard to see them recovering in time for a massive finals push. It'd want to it'd want to turn around this week. Like you said, when the Demons were having their lull, I said it couldn't have happened at a better time. You... In, in racing terms, you know, you can't just lead your whole way around the race and expect <laughs> to bolt down the straight at a million miles an hour. You need a time you run. Melbourne have done theirs, and Bulldogs have timed their lull at the worst possible time, excluding final series itself. So, <clears throat> injury troubles as well, obviously, with Joshy mm. Bruce going down. Norton, the lone man up there, there were talks last night on the footy shows for them to bring Mitch Wallace in, which could be an interesting manoeuvre. But yeah, I'm not I'm not too sure where the Bulldogs go from here and how they fix it up. They just need to fix that midfield up. Well, they were also talking about Steph Martin's close to coming back, but 34, hasn't played all year. I'm not sure he's going to be able to carry the workload through a whole final series. But if he comes back, Tim English can move down forward. I think that's the sort of chatter. And it does straighten them up a little bit. But it's their midfield, which is a little bit worrying. And the Hawks absolutely went to town on it. Another impressive victory uh, on the back of (laughs) Alistair Clarkson's (laughs) departure. I think Dan Howe had career best numbers. Tim O'Brien, Mitchie Lewis, uh, Kaczynski, they all got involved. So another great performance. And... It's quite funny. I saw Kane Corns saying they still have the worst list or the furthest away from a flag if you look at their list, bar Adelaide, he said. And I don't know why, but I sort of do still understand what he's saying. If you do look at the Hawks' list of the young players, they're still on that 50-50 sort of mark where it's like, well, this could just be a name that we all forget in a couple of years or it could be a name that's in the regular 22. But no matter you know where I think their their list is at or where Kane Corns thinks their list is at, 
they are performing at the end of this year. So it'll be interesting to see in that key sort of start to next year whether these players that we are still iffy about after another preseason can turn this ship around for the Hawks. Yeah, yeah. Clarko can't coach. Um, <laughs> you'd, want, you'd want to be paying him a million dollars to coach elsewhere next year. Let me tell you something for nothing. They've taken this list, which, you know, Cornsy, as you, as you described, uh, said is the worst, uh, the, fur- the list furthest away from a premiership. I thought the exact same thing. I look at their list and, you know, I, I just... I don't see that young talent where you go, oh, wow, you know, like when you're looking at the days a few years ago and you saw Oliver and you saw Petrarca and you saw Gorney and these superstars and you're like, yeah, that is, you know, when Richmond won the premiership and they have those five big stars, your Martins, your Cotchins, your Rances, your Rewalts, you need to be able to see that nucleus mm. and you could see that nucleus at the Demons. I reckon you can even see it at Carlton. But I, I struggle to see where that nucleus is for Hawthorne for their next premiership. And Clarkson, since his sacking, has uh, won three out of three, undefeated. And you got to ask if Hawthorne fans are happy about it. One, because now this puts even more pressure on Sam Mitchell um, because, you know, he's always going to be compared to the win-loss ratio from the year before. And now that's going to be even harder to, uh, to overcome. And uh, also, they're, going, they're sliding up in the draft Draft picks up in yeah. chronic, so instead of, instead of having to pick one or two, they're gonna they might have a pick six or seven. So and that has a potential to really hurt a rebuild. Um, one so thing, one thing that I don't think I've seen, and I'm comparing these this year to the years that I grew up in watching the game, and the years that I grew up in, I think I've spoken in recent weeks. Your bottom side won two games. Your top side lost two games. The eight was locked with three rounds to go. That's just how things were for a while. But I can't believe uh, this year in particular that the when you're coming up against the bottom side, they're batting well into the end of the season. Like oh, No one wants to play the Hawks, I wouldn't have thought, coming into the last couple of rounds because they're pinching wins. And years gone by and the years that I remember watching footy as a kid, the bottom two, three sides in the last couple of rounds, you'd lick your lips at. That's 100 points. That's your margin, uh, your percentage boosters. That's that's where yeah you really start to fine-tune and just have a bit of uh, witches' hats footy going into the last round. But these bottom four sides, your Collingwoods, your Norths are being, and your Hawthorns, are being really competitive late in the season, which I think is really impressive. Yeah, well, it seems like we've gotten to a point where um, you know, go back 20 years, you would have some clubs that were way fitter than others just because they had better culture, better fitness teams around them. Um, you'd have some clubs with just better better players because, um, like, the Northern Knights, like, the development programs weren't as impressive as what they are now. Yep. I think we're getting to a point where the 22 blokes you run out onto the park are all very good footballers. Like, you, you don't have many full-blown should not be playing AFL up to league standard footballers out there. Yep. And they're all super fit. And we're getting to a point where the league is so equal that it's just the slightest fine tuning that separates the best teams from the rung below. Um, and I think we have gotten to a point where anyone can win on any given Sunday. All it takes is for one team to be 2% off and your team to be that extra bit on and any team can win. So it's absolutely beautiful to see. Uh, but if we're heading over to Perth now for Frio versus the West Coast, uh, Dossie Mack, um, what a strange game. <laughs> We've bashed West Coast a lot. Do we, do we need to bash them anymore? Um, well... I think we got two more rounds to bash them. I think by next year, uh, the pressure's off a little bit because I think the expectations will be uh, reassessed. But a team that, yeah, I think a little bit more bashing. But not necessarily, though, because Freo were very impressive. And earlier in the year, I think the form of Freo and West Coast going into that first derby or derby um, was, I, I thought Freo would win that first derby. Uh, derby earlier in the season. I think West Coast just came off a massive loss to the Cats and Freo were ticking along, ticking along okay. So when Freo came out and got smashed by 10 goals, I was going, when are, if it's not now, when? Like, yeah. if it's not now, never, to be honest. Like, if Freo can't beat West Coast this season, they're both evenly matched, then put a line through them. Like, it's going to go from 11 <laughs> Derby wins in a row to 55. Um, and then... To come, you know, 12 weeks later or whatnot, 
sort of a similar situation. West Coast are vulnerable. Freo are flying. They have to get it done. I was going into this game still thinking that that sort of bully mentality would just take over and that sort of um, lie down attitude from Freo would bob up. But it did feel like a bit of a line in the sand sort of game. And it was Freo's home game, so it was packed out in the purple. And that first quarter, they blew West Coast off the park. They kicked 50 points, which was just outrageous, and won the game pretty much from there. And then West Coast had a little bit of a a, a gallant fight back, which they seemed to have in a lot of games. They did it against the Tigers and pinched it. They did it against the Ds and fell short. And they sort of did it against Freo and, um, yeah, couldn't quite get over the line again. So a a gallant sort uh, sort of token fight back, but... It was all Freo, and it was a very, very impressive win, and an impressive win which could it keeps them in the finals race. It probably doesn't get them over the line, but it really sets up their year next year. We now know the standard of Freo, um, and I feel like the tide is turning a little bit in WA footy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you talked about that sort of comeback from the West Coast, the token comeback, and I, I think it was tokenish because when you're 50 points up from the Dockers, you you can let the foot ease off that accelerator a bit and when West Coast start making a charge you can turn it back on again so I think the only reason West Coast had that opportunity to work their way back into the game was because Freo was allowed to be 50 points up in the first place Mm. Um, but yeah it's it is quite astounding how West Coast could be under the pressure they've been under and it's not just people coming out in the media or blokes doing podcasts in their garage like us (laughs) coming out and saying uh you know, they're lazy and they pick and choose when they turn up and, you know, they're, they're a bit weak, they're a bit fragile. It's uh, They were showing vision of specific players and going, this is not good enough. Look at his jogging and the Freo bloke, uh, the opposition are just storming past them. And it's amazing that with finals on the line, the playing the arch nemesis in front of a pack crowd, to not score in the... Or to be down by 50 points at quarter time, that really... Defies belief. Playing, by, playing uh, the arch nemesis, which they have like the wood on, and they have the mental sort of fortitude to, if they bully early, they probably win. If you bully Freo in the first fifteen minutes, it probably sets the tone for the rest of the game. Considering uh, the the losses in the past and the way the losses have been, so it felt like that first fifteen minutes was really, really important. And if Freo came and uh, you know took it up to them and, and showed that sort of line in the sand first 15 minutes of footy, it, it could go a different way and it absolutely did. And once again, David Mundy is huge. Whenever I watch Freo games, he gets that many handballs handballed to his toes that I feel bad for the old fella, but he is so clean. Um, it, it might go to a couple of their other midfielders who fumble because um, they're just you know contested bulls. But a David Mundy, he just whips it up off his toes, and he's just so clean with his hands. And, um, yeah, someone that I like in particular, and I hope I've got the name right, but it's Brandon Walker from the back line. He's got a bit of yeah, run. Yeah, he looks good, doesn't he? Got a bit of run and dash, and um, I think that's super exciting for Freo supporters. But it, it now shapes the finals uh, for West Coast. Instead of having the finals in their own hands and their destiny in their own hands, it now makes it a bit of a slim chance. So for West Coast to make it, they need to beat the Lions at the Gabba. The Lions are currently punishing bottom eight sides and they've got a little bit of a run on. So you feel like that could be a bit of a tall task. But then uh, the Bombers need to lose to the Pies. And given recent form... um, you probably see the Bombers winning that. So West Coast have had potentially a bit of a failed campaign. Yeah, I agree, and I absolutely agree. But I just feel like the way this season has gone, there's one more turn that we mm. just don't see coming. Like yeah. Col- Collingwood somehow will bob up, play the game on their life, beat Epsilon, um, and West Coast could go over to Brisbane and just absolutely thump them by 10 goals. I don't know what the situation is, but I feel like there's one more... Tail in tail to tail, um, but yep. I we said it a few weeks ago. In fact, we called it ages ago that West Coast won't make the eight. <laughs> I, I, I want to see when we called that because I reckon that was like when round, they were like round eight ish. We were saying uh, was it Pretenders or well, we said Pretenders. We but said then Pretenders a little, real early, and then a little while after that, we said they won't make the eight, and we said Essendon will make the eight. Yeah. Um, 
So energy's some bit of form if we if we can allow ourselves <laughs> the opportunity to give ourselves a pat on the back. So yeah, for the ninety percent of rubbish we say that isn't true, uh, <laughs> you know there is some fine bits of gold out there <laughs> which which do come um, true. There is a few games this weekend coming up. We we don't talk about we don't preview the round coming up much, do we? It's purely a review show of the week before. Maybe <laughs> we look into that next next year. Yeah, um, no, we'll the, talk to the producers and we'll sort that out we'll for see sure. What we can do. Uh, but if we do look to the weekend ahead, um, there are a few games that really shape the eight. Uh, one of them being Port Adelaide. Uh, who have they got? Who are the Port? Are they, they playing got the, the Bulldogs? Doggies? Yep. Yeah, they're Port Adelaide are playing the Doggies, and I've got to ask you, who is in front in your power rankings? Is it Bulldogs or the Power? Who would you consider a greater chance of winning the flag at this point? Oh God! Well, I can't believe so. Uh, cast our mind back three three or four Saturdays ago. The Bulldogs in the wet get over the Ds. Tight tussle, kick a couple of late ones, 20-point win. They're on top of the ladder. I thought minor premiership sewn up. I thought the Bulldogs were home and hose considering their run home. <sighs> you fast forward a couple of weeks and if the Bulldogs lose and the Lions win, as you like to say, the bookies' favourites. Well, actually, the Bulldogs losing, I wouldn't say, is the bookies' favourites, but... You know the Lions win and the Bulldogs lose. The Bulldogs are fifth. The Bulldogs that will finish. That is amazing. Fifth. That is amazing. The Bulldogs could absolutely lose to Port Adelaide. <laughs> Considering, and it is time for the power to stand up. For goodness' sake, they're coming over to Marvel against the top four side. Even if the top four side is wobbly, if you want to shake the pretender tag, now's your chance. Um, well, we we did just give ourselves a big pat on the back for labelling West Coast pretenders and um, saying they won't make the eight. But I believe we did we did we label Port Adelaide pretenders? Oh, we did. Yes, I think we may have. Yes, and um, <laughs> look, they still um, have they beaten a top four team yet? I'm not sure if they have. I don't think they have. No, and, so and they're, they and they're three and five against the top eight. Yeah, so I'm still happy to whack the pretender <laughs> label on there, even though they were at some point during the weekend. I think they were on top of the table, but um, yeah, if the if Port Adelaide uh, do finish in the top four and Bulldogs do not finish in the top four, then it is quite obvious that Port Adelaide are in front of the power rankings. <laughs> uh, but assuming they both do make the four, who would you give a better chance of winning the flag to? Well, I'd, I'd like to see how the result goes, but. You know, considering that's not the game we're playing, I still think the Bulldogs. I think their best footy, it's a little bit uh, downhill skier. Like, it, it, if it's on the Bulldogs' terms, it is happy days. Like, if, if the Bulldogs are licking their lips at Marvel, fast footy, and they've just got it on their sort of day, they'll punish you. So, I think that footy is probably a little bit more scary because it's like if they get a run on, they'll put you away. But to be fair, uh, Port's credit. Their recent form is 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 quite solid. It, it's quite consistent, and it sort of it puts me in better faith than the Bulldogs. But I'm going to say the Bulldogs slightly because Bulldogs at their best probably edges out the power. But it's an interesting debate, and I can't believe like I couldn't believe when I looked at the weekend that the power were up into second or first or wherever they landed for the brief period. I was I was shell shocked. Yeah, me too. Say uh, you're in a privileged position where your mob are on top of the ladder. Uh, who would you rather make the top four? What? Who? Who would? You, yeah. Who would you think gives uh, you the best chance of winning the premiership? Would you rather see Brisbane in the top four, or would you rather see the Bulldogs in the top four? I'd. Well, whatever I say will come back to bite me. Regardless, I'd probably say Bulldogs. I think Brisbane. Um, throughout the year haven't quite shown how good they can be, but they play that real sort of tough, contested. Uh, win at all costs footy when to me uh, and that's the lines I'm talking about to me the Bulldogs play really outside sort of champagne footy and I feel like in a prelim that tough contested hard footy is probably the one that'll edge you out and coming up against like a Brisbane and a Sydney really worry me to be honest Um, and yeah so I'd probably say yeah the Lions. Yep, absolutely. Speaking of the team from uh, the Sunshine State, and of course I'm not talking about the Gold Coast because why would we bother? I'm talking (laughs) about the Brisbane Lions. Uh, They keep on keeping on. Big Joey, Charlie Cameron, Lockie Neal, Zorko, they're all in form. Um, 
And like we've said, they can take the top four spot. And I was only listening to um, uh, Chris Fagan. He was he was on on the couch or three sixty. Um, I reckon two weeks ago, and he was like, you know, we're disappointed. It looks like we are now no hope of making the top four, but we'll keep on playing good footy. And as we saw from the Bulldogs a few years ago, you can win from outside the eight. So we'll keep on trying to find our best form and who knows what can happen in finals. And here they are. They'd be almost even money to make the top four now. So uh, absolutely anything can happen. And uh, did you watch this game? I didn't watch the game. To be honest, I was um, celebrating my birthday. I was out on a Saturday night. But um, How remiss of me not to mention at the start of the podcast <laughs> uh, that, it, that it was the, the birthing of the great man, the celebration <laughs> of one of the greatest individuals to ever grace uh, the social network platform that is YouTube. I uh, couldn't be any more regretful in my, uh, in my underappreciation of your birth. <laughs> Don't worry, mate. Yeah, you'll be hearing from, uh, from the producers. You might have to miss out on a show or two for that. But um, <laughs> no, yeah, so I did miss the game, but I did see that Joe Danaher cashed in. He's kicked five and he's going to be a pivotal role for the Lions in the finals. I think Dan McStay bobbed up with three as well. So, and I think Charlie Cameron, well, to be honest. So that forward line is clicking even without Hipwood. Uh, I think it would have to continue to do that for them to be a real sniff. But they've got they've got the, the sort of engine room to do it and they've got the polish in the forward line to do it. So there's no... And and they're and they're seasoned veterans by now. They've had two or three finals, uh, finals cracks at it. So it's sort of not now or never. The window's not closing, but it's sort of like you got to get a wriggle on. It's your third season of consecutive finals. It, it, it's sort of in the next year or two, it's got to happen. So they are primed for it. Um, but well, I uh, I do hope Lions actually finish in fifth. Just for the sake that yes. I want Essendon to finish eighth and have Joe Danaher up against the Bombers. Imagine the that. Line. And I could just <laughs> see Joe going absolutely... One of two ways, either going <laughs> absolutely bananas. We're talking 55 out on the boundary, left foot sleeper, bang straight through the high diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, or having one of the all-time stinkers you've ever seen. Um, <laughs> well, I just so feel like, like him at a, at a packed gabber. Um, oh, you just feel like he'd get off the chain, don't you? Yeah, I do think so. And Essendon supporters would absolutely hate to see it. I know Essendon supporters are absolutely basking in seeing uh, Adam Saad getting a bit teary on the bench and, you know, uh, Carlton not making the eight when everyone wrote the bombers off and this was our time to shine. I know they're, they're basking in that, so I hope they do see a little bit of the their comeuppets with Joe Danaher <laughs> going berserk the first week of finals. Well, and, and the Pies as well, I suppose, in that game, very uncompetitive. Uh, the the end of the season couldn't come quick enough. I feel like, in a weird way, and this will be a, a bit of a weird take, but they sort of have over-exceeded expectations during times of this season. Now, obviously, round one, if you were saying, you know, they're going to dwindle out of the season, finish second last or third last, that's not over-exceeding expectations. They wanted to play finals. But after we learnt where they were at, uh, Bucks got the sack. They started injecting all this youth, like the amount of young players that they have coming through is very, very exciting. I feel like that list, that core list of 18, 19-year-olds has played some good footy throughout the year. So I don't think it's all dire down at Pyland. No, it is interesting, though, to see what's happening with their coaching race. Um, it, apparently, they uh, are yet to reach out to Ross Lyon. I don't think... I think Alistair Clarkson's not really interested. Um, and it looks like they're going down the, the route of, like, a Don Pike or a... Someone who's had a go at coaching before and maybe a Voss. I think he got ruled out the other day. I could I think, be wrong there. I think Brad Scott's getting thrown up a little bit. Is well, I would. I, I, I like Brad Scott, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think he took North Melbourne. Like, when you look at North Melbourne now, the thought of them getting to preliminary finals is... Uh, is a bit hard to fathom. Um, so he took them to preliminary finals, and uh, oh, that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me, I think, yeah. um, to suggest that down the track he could be better off for it. And, uh, and I'll, you know, just a tough, tough character, and I think he would hold them in good stead down at Pie Land. Yeah, so Pikey might be on his way to the Pies or someone similar, but uh, there is still the question of who will be going to the Blue Baggers. Um, we know that Teague, unfortunately, uh, will not be there in the coming future. And he, he, you know, it's starting to get talked about now. And completely fair <laughs> enough, Jay, he's been treated poorly. Like, well, really poorly. I was just about to ask you, is it 
a little bit disrespectful that the whole league has accepted that he's gone and he hasn't been told yet. Like, it would be a miracle if he isn't sacked and everyone in the AFL landscape has just accepted that he has been sacked. So if that is the case and if there has been sort of meetings behind the door and they have sort of come to a consensus but they don't want to do it uh, towards the end of the season, they'll do it privately once you know the season's sort of over – if that is the case, I think that's pretty poor management. But maybe they just genuinely haven't made the official decision. Well, this is how I read the situation. He took over from Brendan Bolton, right, when we had the worst list in the league. Like, we were bottom of the ladder, wooden spoon, I think. Um, and a year and a half later, one year and a half after taking over from Brendan Bolton's tragedy that was our our bottom of the ladder squabbling, he uh, he gets put under a, an external review that is under the microscope from the whole league a year and a half in. Think about how long it took coaches like uh, Hardwick and Buckley and Goodwin to get their sides to grand finals. He got a year and a half after taking over the worst team and put under an external review um, that and was in the papers every week, was in the furnace, AFL 360, they're talking about Teague's future. And... What chance have you got? You know, it's hard enough to win for games of football without clouds of judgment or doubt over your head. But knowing mm. that every little move you make is under review would be a very um, anxious experience, I would have thought. Mm. Um, and now we've gotten to a point where uh, the review has been handed back with two games to, to go. You know, it got handed back sort of last week. And I think he knows and I think the club knows that they're going to sack him. But I th- the only reason why I believe they haven't is because last week it was Murphy 300th in the last game. Um, so you can't take the headlines away from him. And Teague loves the f- football club and loves Mark Murphy, so he wouldn't do that. And then this week it's Eddie Betts 350th in the last game. Um, and I don't think he wants to take any of the spotlight off Eddie either. So I think he's in this weird spot where he, he's known he's gone the last two weeks, but um, he's going to tough it out the rest of the season just for Murph and Betts, which shows sort of the individual he is as well. Well, yeah. A couple of things that I've seen in his press conferences, which get you know scrutinised. If we want to talk about getting scrutinised for something that you got to rock up to and front up to, um, a couple of things in his press conference that he said that resonated with me was sort of fighting words. Like this, someone asked him, which is whether it's disrespectful or whether it's a real question or not. Someone said, uh, "So, Tiggy, you're the man for the job." It's like, oh come on, geez, that's very direct. But he goes, "Yep." Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, th- I think I am. I, I do think I am. I, I want to be here. So if they do back him in again, I f- still feel like the attitude from him this whole time has been pretty admirable. He hasn't lost any sort of support in that instance. Whether the footy uh, has been good enough, potentially not, but he hasn't sort of shied away from anything. And I think he's conducted himself really, really well as a leader, if that sort of makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. But it would be a lot easier for me to defend the man uh, if we didn't have 19 unanswered goals kicked against us at the hands of Port Adelaide on the weekend. Well, you started quite well. In that second term, I think, or maybe first term, you were leading by about 20 points. Yeah, and we did have have significant cattle out. We had Mackay, Jones, Silvani, uh, the list goes on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you can't be copying 19 unanswered goals no matter what. We saw Hawthorne with half a list in draw against Melbourne earlier in the season. So anyone, you know, you have 22 AFL players out there. You should be able to not have 19 unanswered goals kicked against you, especially not when it's Mark Murphy, a club captain and club legend, uh, 300th and last game. Mm. You can't be dishing that up. Well, you know, I was prepared to rinse West Coast when sh- when they did it to Shannon Hearn. They didn't rock up for Hearn's milestone game, um, and I absolutely barraged them. So I have to do the same for Carlton, and um, I'd be more than happy to because I was pretty disgusted seeing what I saw. Um, just a quick one on Murph. My first ever footy memory ever that I can remember is being in the car. Dad had SEN turned on because it was a draft uh, and he was that excited. He was telling me, son, this is the start of where we turn things around. I didn't even know what turn things around meant. I didn't know that <laughs> Carlton was shit. I didn't even really support footy at the time. And pick one, Carlton, Mark Murphy, dad was wrapped, uh, went to the game the next year, um, round one to watch Murph run around. Very exciting. And I have not watched a game of football with since, you know, other than when he's injured or whatnot, without Murphy running around. So it was sad to see him uh, retire. 
but obviously the right call had to be made. And now Eddie Betts has come out this week and done the same. Um, he was the first. He was my first favourite player. Had his number on my back all growing up. Um, went down to uh, Science Works, I believe it's called, which is where he was doing an autograph signing. He was the first player I got an autograph on photo of. I was devastated when he left, but so happy when he came back. And um, I don't think you'll see a better example of a beautiful, beautiful human being and footballer as long as you live. So sad week for the Blue Baggers, but um, uh, sorry for rambling, but just to give you a bit of gossip, I'm sure you've heard, Ross Lyon, I believe, will be yes. the coach of the Carlton Football Club. Well, yes, I did see how he's uh, warmed to it, it seems. He's warmed to it after a bit of a bump in with Lee Matthews, who said, Listen, Ross, you're young. You miss game day. And then all of a sudden, Ross goes, yeah, no, you're right, Lee. <laughs> after being staunch, <laughs> Don't believe that for a second. <laughs> after being staunch all year about how he wants to continue on with his real estate and his media commitments, he bumps into Lee Matthews and says, oh, yeah, no, look, you're right, Lee. I, I do sort of want to coach again. The Carlton job is probably the one that makes the most sense. They Kane Corn says you're a four-goal better side with a defensive coach, which... I think makes sense. Some people have ridiculed that, but that does make sense in my head. Like, um, if you tighten up that leaky defence, because you know our turn, your turn, footy, it isn't a great uh, a great brand to have because it can have you on the back end of some pretty pretty de- devastating losses. But you tighten that that defence, you've got the the personnel to have um, a, a really good defensive team. I think that midfield needs to get a little bit more defensive, but I could see like a Ross Lyon in particular. This is a man who loves the lockdown football. If we're going to talk about winning flags with uh, with low scoring and defensive footy, and I also think with a couple of years out, he might... I don't think... Well, I'm hoping he doesn't just play that blanket defence that Ross Lyon plays, but I'm hoping that he has a little bit of balance because I feel like, yeah, a Carlton with that defence and we know how well that they can attack could be a pretty lethal side pretty quickly. Well, I think the combination of a defensive, ultra-defensive coach plus a coach that can get the best out of his players um, will hold us in good stead. You know, if he can take Fremantle and St Kilda, possibly the two most (laughs) nondescript clubs in the competition besides the Gold Coast, if he can take them to grand finals, then hopefully he can be the one bloke that can turn this club around. Um, And, you know, we have so many players like your Zach Williams and your Saad and your McGovern's who um, haven't probably been performing to the best of their Capabilities. So the defensive mindset match with getting the best out of the players we have, the cattle we have, uh, hopefully will be what finally launches us into the eight. But I refuse to fall into our trap of pre-season <laughs> optimism because, oh, we've got the gun recruit, we've got the new coach, everything's going to change because every time I get left exactly where we are now. So although I see the potential, I refuse to buy into the excitement. Well, yeah, um, I think I think this off-season in particular, it's probably the one where if I'm in the boardroom at the footy club, I think it's... Let's not say the F word. Let's not... Like, you don't have to sell memberships at the minute. You're the third most uh, uh, most supported side in the league after being one of the most unsuccessful sides over, like, a, a period of time. So I don't feel like there needs to be much hype or oversell under deliver. I think this is a season where it's sort of lips tight, go to work, another preseason with these young guns. I think Sammy Walsh will be hitting his third or fourth. This is the time where you can start to turn it around. So I think it's sort of undersell, over deliver time. And I think the Carlton Footy Club can do that. I hope so. Uh, one team that is sort of over delivering for a lot of teams, uh, a lot of people's expectations is the Giants. Um, wow. I, I would have written them off earlier in the season, no doubt. But, uh, I had them tipped. I'm, I'm still equal on top of the tipping, but I've changed me. I changed <laughs> me. Uh, changed me strategy three weeks ago from your conventional tip who you think is going to win to tip all the bookies favourites because I'm on top and I don't want to surrender my lead. Uh, and I ha- it's cost me three tips so far. It cost me another one on Friday night. I had Giants in from Monday to Saturday, uh, Friday, because I was convinced that they were the bookies' favourites. I didn't even think about it. I thought the Tigers are shit. The Giants are playing great footy. And then I checked my phone a minute before, 10 minutes before the game starts just to check the odds, maybe put a cheeky little multi on for the weekend. And I say, hang on, the Tigers are sixty favourites. What the hell? What do the bookies know that I don't? So I changed my tip last minute. All right, I'll back the Tigers and they get absolutely wallops. So let me give you some advice, people listening. Don't 
ever change your tipping technique <laughs> from tipping who you think is going to win to the bookies favourites because it's cost me big time. Yes, well, I think some bookies um, might need to take a leaf out of that, that, sort, of, that, that sort of attitude. Uh, yeah, you can get sucked in to the, the favourites sometimes. And, like, sometimes I'll look at the favourites, um, which is a it's a funny little phenomenon, the, uh, the, the betting favourites. But sometimes you'll look and you go, that team's not winning. Like, I don't – I can sort of understand how the public and, and the punters might – think this but i can guarantee you the team that's not favorite will win because you can just tell um and i yeah. think on the weekend it was one of those examples no toby green he obviously got suspended for the forearm to danger fields neck How, well i've got i've got a bit of a query when you get mm. subbed off for the medical uh did they just scrap that 12 day thing because I've seen so many players get subbed off but then come back. Like Dangerfield got subbed off, but he played this week. And I thought if you got subbed off... Is it off, only for the concussion now where you got to miss an automatic 12 days? Yeah, maybe it is. But I thought I thought that, yeah, I thought the catch with the sub initially was that you had to miss the, the following week. Um, but yeah, that, I, I, don't like, I don't like the sub. I want the war of attrition. I, 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 to, so I, I don't like this. I, I don't mind the sub actually, but I like... Um, I don't like calling it a sub. I like saying that we've got like an active emergency. So one of the – there's four emergencies that, that's at the game. One of them's going to sit on the bench and he can get used. But I don't like the thought of like him getting a game without playing. I think everyone's got that same idea. Um, and I don't really like yeah, people getting subbed in and subbed out. I like the thought of it, an emergency that can be activated. Yeah, I love the war of attrition. I love when, um, you know, I remember going to a Carlton and Essendon game where Essendon did, had two players doing ACL in the first quarter. Um, and, you know, it was a real even match and they ended up holding on for a draw with du- with Dustin Fletcher tackling Jeff Garlett running into an open goal. Oh, uh, yeah, Saturday afternoon and football, Michael Christian going off his head. Yes, and um, one of the all-time games of football. And it was like, the, when you know, when you, you lose a couple of players, it happens in local footy, and your coach is there going, we will overcome the adversity. This isn't when we fall down. This is when we stand yes. up. All that sort of stuff. I love that. I don't like, you know, someone goes down and another one comes on. I think that's part of the game. Yeah, I think because of the trend of the amount of injuries over the preseason, yeah, they just tried to cushion the blow. Uh, I think it might have been sort of, regular that that would happen in games if they didn't bring the sub in but they just tried to cushion the blow considering they were going from 16 minute quarters to 20 but yeah the uh the tigers we did rule them out so i did say this a couple of weeks ago on the pod that it was quite obvious that they weren't making finals um and it was quite obvious that they weren't a contender anymore and i was sort of scratching my head that the commentary around them, and I know they've earned this respect, so I, I do understand this commentary, but the commentary around them was like, so, do you think the Tigers are going to make the eight? And I remember Nick Rewald in particular was like, yeah, you can't can't write them out. Yeah, no, you can't write them out. So if, if they get it right, they'll make it. And I'm like, well, you're not really answering. Like, off what you've seen this year and, you know, the form of everyone else. I think you could write them out. And that's why we said dynasty over. And then I think a couple of weeks later, we said Tigers won't make it. I think when they bobbed up and beat the Lions, I went, hang on. Well, <laughs> you know, here they come. But yeah, I just can't believe that the people, uh, especially the the experts, haven't quite <laughs> put a line through them. But I do understand that that's off the back of three out of the last four premierships. But Taranto, someone I want to talk about. Toby Green out, Taranto in, goes, plays that role. Midfielder should sit down in the forward line more often. He's just gone Absolutely. and kicked a lazy four. And a very impressive impo- uh, performance and a real like for like. He played that exact same role that Toby Green plays. Yeah, absolutely. I love Timmy Taranto. That draft yeah. it was uh, Tim Taranto, uh, McGrath. Who was the other one in that top McLuggage? three? McLuggage. Yes. Yeah, that, oh. that's, that's a <laughs> handy little top three there. I like that. And it's hard to separate. I think uh, there was a time where McLuggage hit the lead, but I think, uh, yeah, this is a tough one. I think McGrath's number three, and then you can pick and choose the other two. But if McGrath's uh, number three, that's, you know, you're laughing, really. Yeah, absolutely, and he because he is a star old pigeon. Yep. Uh, but yes, <laughs> GWS they they they're gonna make the eight. There's no is there many situations where they don't make the eight? I don't think so. I think uh, I think they're a game and a half above. 
Yeah, so they're going to... Nah, uh, they're four on 42 points, and West Coast and Freo are outside the eight right, on right. 40 points. So, But GWS have Carlton, so uh, they're making the eight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you something for nothing right now. So why don't the Johns, and they're going to get Toby Green back, and... That's it's, we got to remember. This is a side that uh, it wasn't long ago they were in the bi- the big dance. So yeah, and yes, they've had talent walk out the door, but they keep on getting these these this talent through the door as well and developing. So and it's not a co- it's not a coincidence. Talent. Like it, it's top end talent, and they've got pick three this year again. I believe I think they've got Collingwood's pick three. Um, I I don't know who it's going to be. If it's going to be Essendon, the Giants, or Sydney. Um, but one of those three sides who are in the, the bottom three positions of the eight will cause a bit of damage. I think you'll see I'll, – I'll make a call right now. I think you'll see one of those three teams fire into a prelim final. Yeah, and I do reckon I can see a top four team going out in straight sets. Yeah. I hope it's not Melbourne. It won't be Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne and Macon. I hope it's I hope not. it's – you know what I would be excited for if it was Geelong? I'd love to see Geelong go out in straight sets. That would really throw a cat amongst the pigeons. <laughs> well, no, throw, throw a cat out at the pigeons. Yeah, um, absolutely. We'll, we'll touch on the Ds. Uh, they've gone to the top again. I like that they have to keep defending it. it it's quite funny that um, – yeah, like by the time we play our game of football, we're third or fourth, and then by the end of the game, we're on top. So it gives them good incentive to come out and get the performance done. They're starting to get real clinical and real professional. Uh, Adelaide pressed the Ds throughout the game, and it was one of those ones where, as a D supporter, you're sitting there going, hang on, we're not playing our best, we're not the sharpest, but surely we don't drop it, surely we've learned from the games earlier in the season. They came out in the last quarter and got the job done really professionally. And uh, it, it's quite funny. I saw uh, David King talking on the first crack and he said, and it's something that you've said throughout the season consistently, how the Demons, the way they've played, have sort of been the clear best side for the year, which I sounds sort of crazy coming out of my mouth. Um, but if you do take into account, there was a couple of games we probably should have won and we didn't. But if you, you take into account like a, a Hawthorne game, an Adelaide game, and I know there's all swings and roundabouts and sliding doors moments in the season, but I think our combined losing margin is only 40-odd points, if that. So the season has been as solid as I've ever seen. It is the most successful Melbourne home and away season ever. So I, as much as I've gone through all the pain in the world, and I know it means nothing if we don't win the the cup, but it does sort of mean it's a bit of a feather in the cap that I've witnessed, you know, the worst Melbourne season ever, and I've witnessed the best Melbourne home and away season ever. And uh, yeah, Fritter kick seven, uh, Jake Bowie with the rising star. He looks like he's been playing for eight seasons already. And then Luke Jackson, I think, um, you know, he he's one of the four that got nominated for the D's this year. So a good young crop coming through. But I think Luke Jackson now, considering his last couple of games and the way he's played all season, probably is the rising star uh, winner. Well, I couldn't agree with everything you said. And what's so encouraging is that this isn't like uh, Geelong who are sort of uh, all their players are at that that age now where they're going to be retiring in a year or two and this could be their last roll of the dice to win the flag. You were in the privileged position where did you have five players in the under-22 uh, team, squad? Uh Four or five. I can't remember if Harrison Petty got in. I think he did, actually. Yeah. Four, four or five. You've got Luke Jackson winning the Rising Star. And when you drafted him, I remember I raised an eyebrow. I've gone, you've got Max Gorn. What are you doing using your early draft pick on another Ruckman? But it's just turned out to be an absolute masterstroke. And all of your gun players, it's not like it's a Travis Boak who, you know, is uh, on the wrong side of 30. Track, Oliver, the, the list goes on, are all gone. You know, they're all in a ripper age. So, uh it's so, you know, I think you will win the flag this year. I've gone to a few games live and just I've never seen what I saw at the Demons game um, in the sense that you're, you're moving the ball quick up the ground. If it does turn over, usually that means you get absolutely exposed, but not the Demons. Somehow you set up that wall and you are impossible to penetrate. And I think that will just hold you in perfect stead for finals footy. And uh, I couldn't be any more excited to... It may not be this year, but with this list and with these rising stars you keep on bobbing up, it's impossible to see you not winning a flag in the next five. Well, it's been 57 years between flags, and in those 57 years... 
this next couple of years has never been a better opportunity. And <clears throat> I know that I've had the lid on and you've tried to push and prod me throughout the season. Are you excited? Can you see it happening? And I've kept it pretty on the fence the whole time. But um, I think why wait? Why wait till next year? Yeah, like we, we are in a position now. We have the best fitness staff and the best medical staff in the league. There's no surprise why we've had some of the least amount of injuries. The, the um, pre-finals buy is scrapped. So these older teams, they do have a few little little uh, ailments to take care of, like your Geelong. So they don't get that week's break. Melbourne will be going in with a clean bill of health. It's all The stars are aligning. The stars are aligning. So <laughs> And you hate to see injuries, but even with the Bulldogs and Joshy Bruce going down and, you know, it's... Just and everything is looking right for the demons. It's exciting. Just one last little thing on the days. Um, who would you be putting your money on? You know, you're not a big gambling man, but if you make the grand final, you're putting ten dollars into the little tab machine there. Who are you picking for the Norm Smith medal? If the D's won, yeah, I'd say probably Clayton Oliver or Maxi Gorn or Petrarca. Which is, I, I know that's obvious. But yeah. um, I think Max. But if Gorn, you had to go, all right. So they're all reasonable picks. But if you had to lock in one of those three, and you had to give me one surprise X factor for a bit of value, well, well, give me the two. All right, Petra. Uh, I'm going to say Petrarca. Yeah, I reckon he's probably. I think he's primed for this time of year, I, and and his body's primed, and he's just he's got that NBA mentality where it's like, bring it on. This is where I'm meant to be. Dust, yep. Dusty Martin-esque, but not quite to Dusty's level. Um, and then that oh, that other one, I could see Cozzy Pickett kicking a four real important snags, like bobbing well, this up is what and I, kicking a four. I believe I said this earlier in the podcast. If not, it would have been a private conversation with you. But I said that the Demons have the most amount of potential Norm Smith medal winners on your list. It It's take your pick. Any So many players could bob up and star on the day. So I couldn't be any more excited to see you in there. We're starting to run out of time. Is this the first ever week we go without the GBOs? Um, I reckon we skipped the Bombers game, to be honest. I I, I don't mind the GBOs. Uh, Well, we'll we'll quickly touch on the Bombers. They flogged the Suns. (laughs) Jake Stringer kicked five. We can do this in five seconds. They've absolutely <laughs> fogged the Suns. They've made the top eight and absolutely shocked everyone. And Jake Stringer is a new Dustin Martin and will wreak havoc in the finals. And I think that's pretty every Essendon, every Essendon supporter in true fashion is letting me know about <laughs> me tipping them for the spoon. But As uh, they should be. I don't mind it. All right, we'll get into the GBOs and we'll fly through them. Um, okay. Everyone's favourite segment the goals behind and the out on the full. I'll kick things off with an out on the full. I hate, and I've hated it for a while, and you can't change it, and you can't do anything about it. But when a team plays another team in round 23 and then plays each other in the first week of the finals, I'm pretty sure Collingwood and West Coast did it in the 2018 era-ish. Western Bulldogs and GWS have done it um, recently. And now there's potential. It it might not happen. There's a lot of things that could happen this final round. But there is a potential that the Ds play the Cats and then the Ds play the Cats. And there's a potential that the Bulldogs play the Port and then Bulldogs play the Port. I think. I think that is a genuine sniff. So... Oh, it's just frustrating. I don't. I, yeah, I agree I that like it, it is frustrating, and I would prefer without it. But I don't think it's like all negatives. I think there is an added element when you go into a finals game and they played last week, and you go, "What? Well, they played last week. Yeah, Geelong, Geelong smashed Melbourne in the centre clearances. How are they going to fix that up? And you have the week to fix the problems, and then you go again. I like the thought of. All right, this is where we went wrong. We have a week to fix it. This is how we do it and see how each team improves the next week. I think there is an element of coolness to that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, my out on the full, uh, unfortunately, I think I've put them in the barrel a few times and the doggies are very lucky to escape here, but it is the Gold Coast. Um, another shellacking. Mm. Uh, 10 goals plus at the hands of Essendon. And um, I just don't know where to from here. It looks like, you know, Cara Wilson said on Classified last night, she thinks uh, Stewie Jew will be another coach to go. Um, and this is just an, another hopeless club uh, with another coach out the door. And will a new coach fix it? Even if it's Alistair Clarkson, I don't think so. I just don't know how you take care of that problem. Yeah, it's getting a little bit worrying. They've got it's It's next year or never. I feel like if they don't do anything next year... It's not put a line through the, the franchise, but it's getting very, very worrying. Um, my behinds this week now, it, it's more of a, a motivating behind, if anything. We've potted the power all year. We've, mm-hmm. we've written them off. We've ridiculed them. 
If <laughs> Port Adelaide beat Western Bulldogs this week at Marvel, away from home, a top four fancy, a team that we thought would win the minor premiership only a couple of weeks ago. If Port Adelaide do come over and do that, I think a part of me will go, not sure I want to head to Adelaide Oval first week of finals. Now, if you had asked me three, four weeks ago, I would have said, yes, I will lick my lips playing the power in the first week of finals. If Port Adelaide beat Western Bulldogs, I think my mind sh- uh, my mind uh, my mindset changes and shifts a little bit and I start to go, hang on, the power, yeah, building quite nicely. Yep, absolutely agree with that one, mate. My behind is the North Melbourne Football Club and they're a behind because they've won the wooden spoon officially but it's one of the best wooden spoons you'll ever see, I think. I, I think agree. Most teams when, most times when a team win a wooden spoon, it's doom and gloom, it's pessimism. Weirdly, they've managed to win the wooden spoon and convince the league that there's a lot of optimism about the club. So I am a believer in North Melbourne's direction, um, but it is a bit of a behind because they have won a wooden spoon and they've won a few of them over their journey. Yes, they have, but, you know, uh, I, I think the light is sort of just appearing at the end of the tunnel and I think just to touch on your uh, behind, Johnny Noble seems like, and uh, is it John Noble? David yep. Noble. David Noble, David Noble seems like, um, yeah, one of the better picks as a coach that we've seen in recent times. And my goal is Frio, uh, getting the job done against the big bullies of the West. It was their grand final. Now, you have mentioned before on the pod how horses have grand finals, teams have grand finals where they put up every ounce of energy to pull up the upset And that sort of just caps off their year. And I felt like in round 22, a week before the season ends, Freo probably played their grand final against West Coast at a packed house. Um, So fair play to the Dockers who finally beat the 11 game, losing records to the Bullies uh, in West Coast. Well said. My goal is Eddie Betts. Uh, You will not find a better highlights package anywhere. I can comfortably say he has the greatest highlights package of anyone to ever play the game. Better than Rogers um, down at Banyol 2s? Yeah, oh, well, I'm a close second, but even I am happy to concede to Eddie Betts. <laughs> and, um, you know, everything that's been said about him, I can't really add anything more to it. I think everyone already knows the story with Eddie Betts. And it's sad to lose a champion of the game, but I'm grateful that we had him for 355 brilliant games. And you know what I was thinking? Like, yeah, I did see the games that he ticked over, you know, the 350. Um I didn't know how durable he was. If you had told me, and it's not surprising, but if someone said, oh, you know, Eddie Best played 240, I'd go, yeah, that sort of makes sense. But no, he's been a star for a long, long time, 17 years in the system, playing at the elite level, slotting snags out of his behind for fun. Uh, just an absolute champion, and he will Absol- be missed to the game. If you, if you haven't seen the footage yet of um, him addressing the players, uh, it was one of the, you know, because we often see retirement speeches when they come out, um, and it's always good to watch. Like, I love seeing the raw emotion, and they struggle through it, they're crying. Mm. But, you know, it can be a bit cliche sometimes, um, but, you know, they just tick the boxes. But this was um, sort of five, six minutes where he just went through everything, and it was as if he was reading off a teleprompter, but he wasn't. And um, Tiggy got up there and started crying afterwards, and it was just really, really good vision. So I highly recommend watching it. That is beautiful, and congratulations to Eddie Betts for his career, being an absolute star for the comp. And um, I'm really excited to see what he does post footy because I feel like he still has a lot to give. Rog, I feel like that's us done for the Back Pocket Plug Up podcast for another week. Uh, happy days. We got through a little bit longer this week. Yep, that's okay. We'll uh, try and hit two hour mark by grand final weekend. <laughs> we might have to, the way we're going. Uh, we appreciate everyone who's tuned in on the Spotify and the iTunes. We appreciate everyone who's watched on the YouTube channel. And we'll see you next week to talk some more footy on the Back Pocket Plug Up podcast. Keep plugging those back. Going to be your only one there. <laughs> <laughs>